Right now, I'd like to introduce um, Alvaro Bedoya, who's the, the Executive Director for the Center for Privacy and Technology, which is relatively new at Georgetown University. And he's going to have a keynote conversation with Edith Ramirez, who's the Federal Trade Commission Chairman. And um, this is the first time we've ever had a FTC Chairman at that, so I'm super excited. So welcome, please. Good morning. Chairwoman, I'm thrilled to be here with you this morning. Good morning, Alvaro. I'm delighted to be here, and I want to thank um, everyone for being here this morning, and, and I want to thank uh, Tim for the invitation to join you. Awesome. For braving the snow in D.C. <laughs> uh, so, um, Chairwoman, you are uh, effectively the nation's leading consumer privacy officer, and um, you have to do a lot of big picture thinking around privacy, and this morning I want to focus around your big picture thinking on the Internet of Things. But first, I think you have an announcement to make. Yes, I'm pleased to be able to share with all of you that the FTC is um, issuing its Internet of Things uh, report uh, this morning. Um, so I'm pleased to be able to have a chance to, to discuss the report. And um, I hope you all have a chance to, to take a look at it. Wonderful. So um, there seems to be a tension at the core of Internet of Things and wearable technology. Uh, a tension between convenience on the one hand and privacy on the other. At the, um, at the Consumer Electronics Show, you had, I think I saw it, doggy fitness trackers, uh, connected toothbrushes, and, um, and my personal favorite was the smart sock, which was not smart wool sock, but actually a smart sock that tracked the rhythm and cadence of your run, whether you're going to injure yourself. None of these things have screens. And so there are a lot of people who work in this industry who are saying we need to fundamentally rethink the way we do privacy on these devices because it's really hard to get consent from a sock uh, or give consent to a sock. Uh, uh, on the other hand, these, uh, this technology produces extraordinarily sensitive information. At CES, again, you had earbuds that tracked the oxygen level in your blood. You had uh, um, a wearable bracelet that didn't even track, that didn't just track the calories you were burning, it also tracked the calories you were intaking by measuring your blood glu glucose level. And there was also, I think, a wearable fertility monitor. How do you protect privacy? How do you think about privacy for a technology that seems to collect all of your most sensitive data all of the time, but doesn't have a screen to ask you about it? Let me answer that question by backing up a little bit and really Please. getting to um, the first part of uh, where you started, which is, this, you called it attention. Um, I, from my perspective, um, I think the, all of the benefits that an Internet of Things world or a big data world can provide um, really, uh, I think, uh, can only flourish when you take privacy and uh, security into account. Um, and I think it's important to understand how an Internet, things, um, Internet of Things world changes the landscape and what the privacy and data security implications are. And you've already alluded to this, but I think it's worth really delving Please. into a little bit more depth. Um, the first thing is that um, you're right. We're now in a world where data is being collected all the time. Um, and not only that, but we are bringing um, these devices into our uh, homes, into what used to be private spheres, into our homes, into our cars, into our workplaces. We're wearing them. Mm -hmm. um, and the data that is being generated is increasingly much more sensitive. And so that's um, important to keep in mind. And not only that, but just the volume of data that's being generated is exponentially greater now. And what that means is that there are now the potential for these very large data sets from which even very neutral or seemingly benign information, from which you can then inf make sensitive inferences. So that changes the landscape, I think, considerably. So that's one piece of it. Another dimension is um, what happens to that information? Um, if I'm wearing um, a fitness uh, band that is tracking um, how many calories I consume, and I wouldn't want to share that information uh, um, with my insurance company, certainly. But what is happening with that information? I, I, uh, I think a consumer can understand that, it's, that you have access to it, but do they understand that it may, it's possible that it could be sold to a data broker, that it could end up 
in an insurance company's hands. So that's another set of questions that we need to um, think about very closely. And then I think the third um, uh, piece of this uh, that in my mind stands out is the security aspect. A um, few dimensions here too. Um, not only is personal information, deeply personal information um, at stake, um, but as you have more and more devices, um, it also means that there's more potential for exposure. Um, as of this year, experts estimate that there are 25 billion connected devices in the world. Mm -hmm. In the next five years, that number is going to double. So, um, and, and a lot of the companies that are getting into this space um, may not necessarily have expertise in security. Um, a lot, also, a lot of the devices are small. Uh, many of them are low cost, making um, security uh, much more challenging. And some of these devices that we're using could also implicate our physical safety. So it's not only personal information that's at stake, but also uh, personal safety. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a couple of those, sharing and security. So first on sharing, this is, I think, one of the aspects that troubles a lot of the consumer privacy folks, that all that sensitive data doesn't necessarily stay private. The FTC released a survey last year of 12 health and fitness apps, a couple of which are connected to wearables. And it found that those 12 apps, which I think included a diabetes app, a symptom tracker app, and a pregnancy app, those 12 apps shared their data with 76 different third parties. What's, what, if anything, is wrong with that picture, and, and what is the FTC doing to fix it? This is another issue that um, is a problem in this area, and that's just the, the lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that we um, emphasize in our report is the continued importance of notice and choice. Um, I think it's really fundamental that if you want um, these new technologies to flourish, you need to make sure that consumers understand what's happening, understand what information is being collected, understand um, with whom that information is being shared, how it's being used. And so um, it's really, in my mind, fundamental that consumers continue to be in the driver's seat, that they have a say over their own information and how it's being used. Um, now, granted, you mentioned the, the wearable, the, the sock, um, right. and all of these other it's devices. I mean, the, a lot of these devices don't have any consumer interface, or they have one that's very small. So what I think companies need to do is that I think that they need to be innovative, not only in the types of products and services that they're providing, but they also need to be innovative in the way they um, communicate with consumers. And another thing that we do um, in our report is to provide some suggestions about ways to get around this problem of how do you provide notice and choice mm -hmm. in an Internet of Things world. Um, but I think uh, companies can, there's so much ingenuity out there that I think it needs to be deployed um, in a way that will um, give consumers uh, the, the, the transparency that they want and also the control that they want. So you want to see innovation for privacy? Absolutely. What about security? So let's say you, know, you are sitting down with a uh, developer or a, a, a new startup that is in the early stages of building uh, a new wearable device or Internet of Things device. What's your advice to them on privacy and security? My advice would be keep both security and privacy top of mind. Um, at the very beginning, there needs to be this culture of security, this culture of privacy. So conduct um, uh, a risk assessment. Um, evaluate um, uh, what exposure you have and devise a plan to deal with it. Uh, make sure that you test any security measures before you launch your product. Um, depending on how large the company is, make sure that there's at least one person that's responsible for these set of issues. Um, and keep also, keep in mind the entire life cycle of a product. Another challenge that comes into play is that um, consumers may keep a product, again, these the products may be small, low cost, some of them may be seemingly disposable. Um, that raises a challenge in terms of security. How do you ensure that these devices stay secure, that, that you can, it may be difficult to update software, to deploy um, security patches. So all of these issues are really crucial to be thinking at the very beginning. Um, so that's one issue, dealing with, with security. But I would also um, say uh, two other things. Um, one is 
the concept of data minimization. I think that it's really important um, in today's uh, world to have companies be very mindful of the data that they're collecting. Um, I don't think that um, it's a good practice to simply say more data is always better. That may not necessarily be the case because you're exposing your company to intrusions. Um, and if you have data that you don't really need, that's an unnecessary risk. Mm -hmm. So in my view, companies need to be thinking very hard. You know, do you really need to collect um, this data? What data are you collecting? Why do you need it? And if you do need it, um, put in place um, retention period so that you dispose of that uh, data after you no longer need it. Mm -hmm. Let's shift gears for a second to, to your commission's uh, data broker report. So last year you issued a pretty powerful report that looked at some of the benefits. It wasn't a one-sided report. It looked at the benefits for fraud prevention and detection, but it also raised some real alarm bells for consumers. And um, for example, the commission found that data brokers were compiling lists of people with high cholesterol who likely had diabetes or who were expectant parents. Um, you had some very serious congressional recommendations, but last year the bill that would have implemented some of those, you know, didn't get a vote in committee. Um, what can the commission do now by itself to further the goals of transparency, consumer control, and accuracy that you put forward in that report? Certainly one thing that we're going to continue to do is to enforce um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue to um, enforce um, uh, Section 5 of the FTC Act. Mm -hmm. Um, so enforcement is going to be key. Um, but a lot of what we're doing is really just raising awareness amongst uh, consumers as well as businesses. I think uh, the report itself shed a lot of light on what, the, what practices data brokers are engaging in. Um, a lot of what um, the, uh, we're trying to do also with our Internet of Things report is to just raise awareness among consumers as well as businesses about the privacy and security implications of what's taking place. So that's another piece of it. So we're going to continue to advocate um, mm -hmm. to data brokers and not only data brokers, but also companies that are interfacing with consumers that sell information to data brokers. We are advocating more transparency. Um, again, I think the, to me it's really vital that consumers know what's happening, that they um, stay in the driver's seat, that they have control over their information. So. We've, in addition to making legislative recommendations in our data broker report, we also recommended best practices um, about how to provide greater transparency. We, we suggested that there be a centralized um, website where consumers could actually learn about data brokers because mm -hmm. many, many uh, consumers don't even know that they exist, don't know that these companies are compiling um, profiles, very detailed and personal, highly personal profiles um, that are based on one's um, age, income, um, race, ethnicity, religious, political affiliations, health, et cetera. And so, so those are important things. And we also then need to be thinking about um, what happens with that information. So our, our data broker report did not touch on how this information is being used, but that's the next set of questions that we need to be thinking hard about. Excellent. So we only have a short time together, so this is my last question. But um, I want to ask you about diversity. Um, I think a lot of folks would look at 2014 and say, um, oh, this was the year of the Internet of Things, or this was the year of wearables. And other folks would say, no, this is the year of cybersecurity, uh, given the aftermath of the Target hack and, and, and the Sony hack. Um, I think there's a real argument that 2014 was the year when we woke up to the role that gender plays on the Internet and in the tech industry. You know, 2014 was the year of Gamergate, where you saw female video game developers viciously harassed and threatened, uh, as well as critics of the video gaming industry. Um, it was the year of, this, of the uh, Apple iCloud uh, breach, where um, most of the celebrities affected were women. Uh, and it was also the year of Uber. And I think a lot of folks, uh, the Uber scandal, a lot of folks forget that that began uh, uh, when the company was responding to a female blogger who was critical of the company's practices on gender. Um, Silicon Valley, to its great credit, has started to issue transparency reports on the diversity statistics of their workforce. And so I want to ask you, um, do you personally think it's important that the tech industry hire a diverse workforce? And if so, why? 
I do think that that's important. And I'm really um, pleased to see that um, companies are talking about these issues and being open about their numbers and also taking steps to address the, the, the issue. Um, so look, I, I think it's important for a multitude of reasons, mm -hmm. but let me just touch on a couple. Um, I think that any company that um, is, seeks to be at the cutting edge um, and innovative, you need to make use of the full talent pool that's available to you. And so I think um, by not uh, hiring and not ensuring that your workforce is diverse, I think you're really missing out on that. Mm -hmm. But let me also ask, uh, make another point, another dimension of some of the issues that uh, um, we've been looking at at the commission have to do with how big data is used and data analytics. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that we also want to emphasize is that while big data has the potential to provide enormous benefits, um, there's also um, potential for bias and for disparate impact. And I also think that it's important that um, companies guard against bias in their analytic systems, in their predictive products, and in, in their algorithms. And I think the more um, uh, diverse a group of people that you have looking at these issues, I think that could really help um, guard against this and put uh, mechanisms in place to um, ensure that you can uh, neutralize those. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you could join me giving a hand to Chair Wyman, Edith Brunner. Thank you.